morning. Well, this side increased in the last couple minutes. So, good for you guys. It's always good to be back here. I never quite know what I should preach on. I pray about it. Lord, show me what, uh, what you want me to speak on today. Sometimes I hit it, and sometimes only the Lord knows. I did have an unusual experience one time. I was going to speak in little Sunday school uh, up out of uh, Myrtle Creek. About a dozen people there, all family, and I'd known them for years. And the only time they get a preaching service is when I show up. Normally they just go through a Sunday school quarterly and sing some songs off key and uh, enjoy themselves. They're, they're neat people. Um, there was uh, a young lady there, prominent part of the family who had um, made a mistake in life and gotten pregnant and had a child out of wedlock. Smart gal, she was pursuing um, uh, a medical degree. She wanted to be a doctor. And I hadn't seen her in a long, long time. And I had a sermon already that morning. That morning I was going to be delivering. And on the way there, the Lord changed my mind. And I just started mentally throwing together an outline. Uh, just putting it together. I tend to think in outline, so it's fairly easy. But the Lord was putting that into my mind. I thought, really? Is this what you want me to talk about? So I showed up there and debating about it till the last minute. And finally I said, okay, Lord, came time for me to get up. And I talked about death. I talked about what death means for an unbeliever. And I talked about what death means for a believer. And finished it on a positive note. And that gal was there and just she was just seemed to be very, you know, very pleased with what she was hearing. Wednesday she was killed in a head-on collision. And I changed my schedule, dumped into the church and went back there that next Sunday. And I walked in the door and they said, you prepared us for this. And I said, no, the Lord did. <laughs> you know, so you just never know what the Lord's going to do, what he wants you to deliver, how he wants you to minister. Um, I'd like you to open to Exodus chapter 2 this morning. You know, normally I don't do this long of a string of story sermons. That's all I've done here for the last three months is tell you stories. Uh, I tend to do a lot more just exegetical preaching or expository preaching from the text, but uh, I've just felt led to give you stories, and so I'm going to give you another story this morning. So, Exodus chapter 2, and let's pause and pray for just a moment. And Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, I would pray that even as I come before my friends, my brothers and sisters with a prepared message, I pray that you would speak through me and to me. Lord, that um, maybe this has nothing to do with the fire and the current situation and such here, but I pray, Lord, that we would have attentive ears, attentive hearts, and that you would touch each one of us in a special way. And may your word minister to us today. And I would ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. I wrote a little poem one time have to tell you about it. I'm not much of a poet. I'll never get published or become, you know, poet laureate and everybody having to uh, memorize my poetry to say in school. But I, I do find myself patting myself on the back a little bit sometimes when I think of this poem and then I immediately repent um, because it goes like this. It isn't really pride that causes me to stumble. What sometimes trips me up is being proud of being humble. <laughs> um, the problem with humility, and by the way, Pam, thank you for the songs. Yeah. 
Ah. <laughs> All I did was suggest Moses and you came up with the song. So the problem of hum with humility is that just when you think you have achieved it, you realize you haven't. <laughs> Funny how that works together. And yet um, it is so important for us as believers to pursue it. Because as 1 Peter chapter 5 verses 5 through 7 tells us, all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another for God is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you this morning I'd kind of like to illustrate for you what I've just said by uh, looking at a man we should all know very well. Um, he's a familiar character in Old Testament history, in fact one of the main characters, and his name is Moses. Um, I'm going to start off by saying this morning that Moses went through three distinct periods in his life of roughly 40 years apiece. And for the first 40 years, we would have to say that Moses was on the wrong track. And yes, it is possible to be on the wrong track. Um, the time was roughly 1520 B.C., more or less. Um, the family of Jacob, whom God renamed Israel, had moved to Egypt some uh, 400 years earlier, and there they become a great nation of people. By the way, how many of you have read the book of Exodus? Good, 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 good. Those of you who haven't, shame on you. Read the book of Exodus when you go home, okay? So you'll know what I'm talking about. Anyway, the, uh, they became a great nation of people, roughly about two to three million, by conservative estimate. And they were so numerous, in fact, that the Pharaoh became afraid and he enslaved them. And still the people kept on multiplying. Uh, in fact, to slow the death rate, Pharaoh commanded that all the baby boys be thrown into the Nile. Get rid of them. Um, and you know the story, I hope, in obedience to Pharaoh's command, a woman by the name of Jochebed put her three-month-old baby into the Nile. See, she was being obedient, only she put him in a watertight wicker basket, hid him in the reeds near the shore where he was safe from the current and hopefully hidden from the crocodiles, because yes, the Nile River had crocodiles. And there he was watched over by his sister Miriam. And I would like to pick up in chapter 2, beginning with verse 5, and on down to verse 10. Then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the Nile with her maidens walking alongside the Nile. And she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid, and she brought it to her. When she opened it, she saw the child. And behold, the boy was crying, and she had pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister, who was their guarding, said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from among the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter, knowing good and well it was going to be the child's mother, that's not part of the inspired scriptures, but I added that in, uh, said, Go ahead. So the girl went and called the child's mother. And then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I shall give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. And the child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter. And he became her son. And she named him Moses and said, Because I drew him out of the water. Now, she was so pleased with this child that she gave him back to his mother to nurse until he was old enough to be taken to the royal court. And that's where he spent the majority of his first 40 years of life there in the, in the palace. Now, we don't know a whole lot about Moses' life for those first 40 years, except for a brief statement that Stephen made in Acts chapter 7, verse 22. And there he tells us that Moses was educated in all of the learning of the Egyptians, and he was a man of power in words and deed. 
Now, Egypt at that time had a lot to offer somebody who lived in the palace. Uh, he would have been instructed in writing and in the sciences and very likely in uh, military and possibly diplomatic skills as well. There was a lot that went into shaping royalty in those days. And I will confess, when I got to this point in writing in my sermon, and this is going to date me, I couldn't help but picture Charlton Heston. <laughs> For those of you who know that far back, when I get to heaven and actually meet Moses, if he doesn't look like Charlton Heston, I'm not going to know who he is. He's going to have to have a name tag. It says, I'm the real Moses on it. <laughs> but anyway, I couldn't help but think about him in playing the part of the building engineer and court favorite. So um, then the day came when Moses was about 40 years old that his carefully constructed world fell apart. And let's pick up with verse 11 on down through 15. Now it came about in those days when uh, Moses had grown up that he went out to his brethren and looked on their hard labors and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. So he looked this way and that and when he saw there was no one around he struck down the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. And he went out the next day, and behold, two Hebrews were fighting with each other. And he said to the offender, Why are you striking your companion? But he said, Who made you a prince or judge over us? Are you intending to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? And then Moses was afraid. And he said, Surely the matter has become known. Verse 15, When Pharaoh heard of this matter, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the presence of Pharaoh and settled in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. Midian, by the way, is out in the Sinai Desert, uh, not part of Egypt. Uh, well, it is now. I don't know if it was then or not. But from being the adopted son of Pharaoh's daughter, highly educated in all that Egypt had to offer, um, trained and pampered in the words of Stephen, a man of power in words and deeds, Moses was now a murderer, an outcast on the backside of the desert of Midian. And believe me, there's nothing out there. I've been there. <laughs> uh, you wonder what on earth the animals eat. For the first 40 years, we'd have to say Moses was on the wrong track. And by that, I meant two things. First is that Moses was being trained to be a powerful Egyptian of the ruling class rather than a Hebrew man of God. He was trained to be a man of strength, of education, and pride. And who knows what he would done if he had, what he could have done if he had continued on in that role as the adopted son of the Pharaoh's daughter. Perhaps he would have been a great building engineer as uh, he was in the movie. Um, maybe he would have been a general of Pharaoh's army or a statesman. Who knows? But for God's purposes, he was on the wrong track at least culturally and spiritually. His education may have helped him in later years, and I think it did, um, but he was not being trained to be a humble, usable man of God, not yet at least. And secondly, I say Moses was on the wrong track because when the time came for action, he acted according to his agenda rather than God's. At some unknown time in his life, maybe growing up, he learned from his mother that yes, he was, he was a Hebrew, not an Egyptian. Whenever it was, uh, in the time of trouble, Moses took matters into his own hand and he killed an Egyptian in defense of a Hebrew slave. You don't do that. And and make Pharaoh happy. And so um, Stephen relates that in Acts 7.25, Moses supposed that his brethren understood that God was granting them deliverance from him. But they didn't. Period. And so it's apparent that God did not see this self-assured, highly educated, and trained, self-styled Messiah as the deliverer of Israel, at least not yet. So for the first 40 years, then we'd have to say Moses was on the wrong track. For the second 40 years, let's just say that Moses had a long shelf life. 
and we'll talk about that here. In Exodus chapter 2, picking up with verse 16 on down to 22. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. Mm -hmm. Then the shepherds came and drove them away. But Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. And when they came to reel their father, he said, Why have you come back so soon today? So they said, An Egyptian delivered us from the hand of the shepherds. And what is more, he even drew the water for us and watered the flock. And he said to his daughters, Where is he then? Why is it that you have left the man behind? Invite him to have something to eat. And Moses was willing to dwell with the man and gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses. Then she gave birth to a son, and he named him Gershom, for he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. I'm debating whether or not to give you my take on this little passage, because it might throw you off from the passage where I'm going with it. But sometimes we read the Old Testament, it just reads so orderly and dull the stories and in my mind I read this passage and I look at that and um, I see the priest of Midian had seven daughters and Moses showed up and watered the flock and they came and told their father and it says here uh, where is he then why is it that you have left the man behind you know how I interpret that where is he you let a man, I have seven daughters, and you left a man outside? Go get him. Bring him in. And I know that's what he was saying because he got married at the end, and, and the father was saying, one down, six to go. <laughs> so anyway, forget I went there, okay? <laughs> so um, here we have, um, especially I want to note chapter 3, verse 1. Now Moses was pasturing the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And Moses, mighty Egyptian, self-styled Messiah, fugitive murderer, was now a shepherd. Um, with all his training and potential, Moses was now a nursemaid to a bunch of smelly, dumb, wayward critters foraging for food in an empty desert. Quite a come down from um, the palace of Pharaoh to a shepherd's tent, don't you think? The Bible is very brief about this period in Moses' life, too. Uh, while the people of Israel were enslaved in Egypt, still groaning under the hand of Pharaoh's overseers, Moses very likely had come by now to see himself as forever removed from that world. Uh, we can only speculate, of course, but after 40 years in the desert, I suspect Moses had given up all hope of ever helping his people. He had tried to do God's work in his own way, and the result had been a disaster. Um, now at 80 years old, I think his only view of the future was hoping that uh, he could see some grandchildren before he died. And I have this mental image, really, of Moses sitting on a rock, looking over his sheep, thinking back time to time to what was and what might have been, and sighing. <laughs> Now, I don't know, I can't speak from experience, but I suspect when one is shepherding sheep, one has a great deal of time for sitting on rocks and thinking and sighing. That is where you're not chasing them all over the place. I do have to tell you right quick, there was a video on Facebook a couple months ago. There was a sheep stuck in a crack. There was a narrow ditch that had been dug by a ditch wick alongside the road. And this guy was helping this dumb sheep get out of the ditch. And he finally got it out and he put it beside it. And the sheep went galloping madly off and then jumped back in the ditch again. So I guess sheep would be interesting critters to have around. Um, there's a term we sometimes use in Christian ministry circles to describe one whom God is no longer using in the ministry. We call it being put on the shelf. Um, it's kind of like um, being a dish that's no longer in use or a book that you've been reading on for a little while and just lose interest in and stick it back on the shelf. Um, and I've known people that I would, I would definitely, from my limited 
viewpoint say yes they were in ministry for a while and then God put them on the shelf and that's where they are but uh, here was Moses he was put on the shelf he was separated from his people disowned by the Egyptian court stuck in the far off desert dismissed from any possibility of service so far as knew as he knew Moses was shelved now that's one sense of what I meant in my description of Moses second 40 years now let me give you a mixed picture though um, because the term I actually used a few minutes ago is familiar to all of us who store food in pantries which is probably most of us and that is uh, the term shelf life you know we all know that refers to how long something like a can of peaches or a box of crackers can sit on the shelf and still uh, still be uh, edible when it's opened in 1975 um, a friend and I were on an extended backpacking trip into the Valley of 10,000 Smokes in Katmai National Monument on the Alaska Peninsula. I actually grew up just about 60 miles away from there and had always wanted to go and visit it and this was our opportunity. And we had stopped for the night at a research cabin. The, the, the whole valley was just bare pumice. Uh, maybe a few bushes here and there, but it, would, the, it had been filled in about 90 feet deep after the eruption in 1912. And we we stopped up on the flanks of Katmai and spent the night in an abandoned uh, University of Alaska research cabin on Baked Mountain and it had been un unused for years but uh, except by occasional hikers like us but there was still a moderate supply of canned goods and on the bare plywood walls inside people had written things over the years 1963 tried the green beans still good and all over the wall people have been trying these different cans of things and posting whether they were still good now we being young were either idiots or very brave so we tried the canned salmon um, and if you were to go to Bake Mountain Cabin today, assuming that it hasn't fallen over yet, you will see on the wall, 1975, trying the canned salmon, still good. So, um, where am I? I described Moses' second 40 years by saying that he had a long shelf life. And by that, I mean that even though Moses didn't know it and may have eventually given all, all hope of it, God had no plans for throwing Moses away in the end. Uh, far from letting him deteriorate during his time of shepherding, God was at work preserving and preparing Moses for what was ultimately to come. His formal Egyptian training no doubt proved useful you know, in many instances in his later life but it was his involuntary training that truly fitted him for the task that God had in mind for him there in the desert he learned to shepherd a bunch of stubborn ignorant wayward sheep who were a lot like the people that God was going to give him to take out into the desert with him um, you have to read Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy to get the full picture of those those people. But um, during this time also of exile, he grew to intimately know the land of Midian as well. And it was the very land that God was going to lead him and the nation of Israel into uh, in their flight from Egypt. But thirdly, and most importantly, though, Moses had 40 years to change from being an impetuous, proud deliverer of his people to a patient, humble shepherd. And for someone who had been raised as an Egyptian, in fact, this was not just a humble position, but a disgusting position. In Genesis 46, 34, we read that when Jacob moved the family to Egypt um, to escape the famine, Joseph advised his father to tell Pharaoh when asked that he was a keeper of livestock because shepherds were considered loathsome to the Egyptians. And now Moses had become a loathsome shepherd. For the first 40 years then, we say Moses was on the wrong track. For the second 40 years, 
We'll say that Moses had a long shelf life. But for the third 40 years, we find that Moses finally became a very usable servant of God. Pick up in uh, verse 23, and I want to read clear on down through 311. Now, it came about in the course of those many days that the king of Egypt died, and the sons of Israel sighed because of the bondage, and they cried out, and their cry for help because of their bondage rose up to God. So God heard their groanings, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God saw the sons of Israel, and God took notice of them. Now Moses was pasturing the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of the bush, from the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. And then he said, Do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said also in verse 6, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters, for I am aware of their sufferings. So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. And now behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me. Furthermore, I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. Therefore come now, and I will send you to Pharaoh, so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. And then verse 11, But Moses said to God, Who am I, that I should go to Pharaoh, and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? Moses was now a humble man. In fact, he was so humble that he tried his best to squirm out of the assignment that God had given him. Please, Lord, he pleads in chapter 4, verse 10, I have never been eloquent, uh, neither recently nor in time past, nor since thou hast spoken to thy servant. Uh, for I am, am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Uh, never mind that Stephen had called him a man of power in words and deeds during his time in Egypt, his first time in Egypt. Please, Lord, he asked again in verse 13, send the message by whomever thou wilt. In other words, here I am, send him. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and the Bible tells us that the anger of the Lord burned against Moses at this point, and yet God consented to send Moses' brother Aaron to him to be a spokesman for him. And so it came to pass that Moses obeyed God, and if you were a good person and read Exodus before, and are going to be a good person and read it afterwards, uh, you'll learn that Moses and Aaron went back to Egypt. They confronted Pharaoh. And it wasn't long until humble, retiring Moses was directly challenging Pharaoh himself. Ten plagues God sent on the Egyptians until at last the Israelites were, about to, were allowed to go free. And I'm sure you've probably heard messages on the Exodus before. I'm not going to go into detail this morning. There's simply too much here to cover in a third point of one sermon. But with the mighty hand of God guiding him and protecting them, Moses led the people out of slavery through the Red Sea and into the desert. And there for 40 some years in the land that he had learned as a shepherd, Moses shepherded the people of God. If God had written a note on the plywood wall of Bake Mountain Cabin, it would read 1445 BC, tried Moses, still good. Better than ever, in fact. As one commentator wrote, the Lord took a self-assured world leader and reduced him, reduced him to the point where he became a useful servant. After first convincing Moses of his unfitness for leadership, God was then able to fit him into 
his plan. In Numbers chapter 12, it's recorded that Moses was very humble, more than any man who was on the face of the earth. And this was the man that God used. Now, those last 40 years in the desert with the people of Israel were certainly not easy years, but God was with Moses through it all. And in his trials, God honored Moses above everyone. When his leadership was challenged by his own brother and sister, God spoke to them saying, Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, shall make myself known to him in a vision. I shall speak with him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in in all my household, when I, with him, I speak mouth to mouth, even openly and not in dark sayings, and he beholds the form of the Lord. You know, I think apart from Adam and Eve before the fall, I believe Moses is the only person in the Old Testament who enjoyed that kind of personal relationship with God. And then at last, on top of um, Mount Nebo, near the edge of the promised land, Moses lay down to die, and just three verses from his epitaph in Deuteronomy chapter 34, verses 10 through 12. Since then, no prophet has ridden, risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. For all the signs and wonders which the Lord sent him to perform in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh, all his servants and all his land, and for all the mighty power and for all the great terror which Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. To be a Christian, one must begin by approaching God humbly, don't you think? I was 27, I've said that before, before I finally admitted that I was a sinner hopelessly lost. And you talk about a humbling moment. I can remember it exactly. It was on Christmas morning and I won't go into it. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, I stand here today redeemed, and you too. No matter what your past may have been, maybe you came to the Lord at two years of age and don't remember. But it means saying, Lord, I blew it. I have to depend upon you. I throw myself at your feet by faith. And in Christ, of course, my world was turned right side up. And I've often looked back at those pre-Christian years and uh, wished that I had become a Christian as a child and not had to waste all those years in rebellion. But like Moses, I had to go through my self-prepared glory years and in due time my own time of humbling. And I have to tell you that my struggle with pride certainly didn't end there at least not for me, and I can pick up on several things I've said just during the course of the sermon that I kind of wince at and wish I hadn't said. There were little pride things popping up here and there, and I suspect some of you, at least maybe one or two of you, have sometimes thought about pride and struggled with it a little, just, just a little bit, haven't you? Really? Okay, I see some heads nodding. We're all on the same page then. <laughs> There's... Um, <clears throat> There's a number of applications I could make probably with regard to the spiritual journey of Moses. As God repeatedly tells us in Scripture, we must um, humble ourselves or run the risk, like Moses, of being humbled. Uh, James in uh, chapter 4, verse 10 says in the NIV, Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will exalt you. And I looked at this yesterday afternoon, and the King James says, Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. And the New American Standard says, humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord. No matter what the translation there, the sense is still the same. As believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, we in more ways than one stand in the immediate presence of God. We can't see him yet. We will see the sun when we go to heaven, but we are in his presence and he carefully examines every thought, our every desire, our every intent, our every motive, our every action. Man looks on the outside. My, what a humble man, brother, what's his name is. Look at him sacrificing himself to care for that, that, that person over there. And uh, what his name secretly smiles to himself and pats himself on the back, sort of being proud of being humble. 
if you will. God, on the other hand, knows our hearts and our minds intimately. He knows true humility, and he rewards it in his way and in his time. Um, I do remember years ago somebody telling me a story of a couple in their church who had money, they were well off, but they deliberately made a point of buying used clothes, and I buy clothes from Goodwill, but they bought used, used clothes from Goodwill and made sure that you saw them in those very used clothes because they were humble. Um, let me kind of close with this. Um, remember the parable Jesus told in Luke chapter 18, verses 9 to 14 of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And he told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. Okay? Um, I fast twice a week. I pay tithes all that I get. God, you're lucky to have me. Excuse me, that wasn't in the original text, but I threw that in. Um, but the tax collector, verse 13, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. And then Jesus said, I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, I have an apology for you this morning. I didn't come with a list of five practical ways you can put true humility into practice this week and the report on it next Sunday. No homework for you to do. Um, instead, let me simply suggest that we all keep a close watch on our hearts, on our minds, our attitudes, our motives, our actions, and frequently ask God for his forgiveness and his guidance. And let God do the work in our hearts that we ourselves can't do, though we need to take that first step. Now, is it pleasing to know that you have truly been humble in something that you have um, said or done? Yes, it is. It should please us because that's what we want, to be pleasing God. And pleasing God should please us because that means we're in harmony with him, becoming more like Jesus. We can even have a reasonable or justifiable self-respect and a positive kind of pride in legitimate things like the way our children turned out or seeing somebody we have worked with discipling, growing in the Lord. And we can stand back and say, thank you, Lord, for, for allowing me to be a part of that process. But to be proud of being humble, well, that's kind of another thing altogether, isn't it? Yeah. To sum all this up, for the first 40 years, we'd have to say Moses was on the wrong track. For the second 40 years, we'll say that Moses had a very long shelf life. But for the third 40 years, we find that Moses became a very usable servant of God, humble and yielded to the will of God. May that be where God would find us also. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what a conundrum. We want to be humble and we're proud because we've achieved it. Yes, I'm humble. The Heavenly Father, you know our hearts. We do want to be a humble people before you, Lord. Forgive us our transgressions. Forgive us the, the self-centeredness that we have, Lord, because we are all very, very much aware of ourselves. Father, I pray that you will lead us, that you will guide us, that you will, whatever it takes, make us a usable people in your sight. That is our desire, Lord. And we yield ourselves to you to do that. And we will thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.